The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov, with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. And now we join Frank Race for the adventure of the Count Trafano Crest. Los Angeles after sundown, a sleepy city, like a giant cat, warm and content, denying its spectacular reputation. Mark was out under the town, and I was sitting in our hotel room reading a newspaper account of a case we had just cleaned up. As my eyes came to the bottom of the column, I glanced down at the floor and suddenly noticed that I either had four feet or company. Since the other pair of shoes on the floor were several sizes smaller than my modest tens, I dropped the paper and looked up about five feet up. He was dressed in a color scheme that might have come from a painting by Cezanne, and had I been a drinking man, I might have taken the pledge. Is Detective Race? Well, the name is Race, but I'm not a detective. What can I do for you? My boss is disappeared. I am chauffeur. You mean he left town without paying you? No, no. Just disappeared. You're fine. Why come to me? This is a case for the police. No, no. No police. Viventi say no police. Who is Viventi? It's me. Oh, well, that explains everything, except why no police. Viventi is uh, on parole from prison. One moment. Oh, I see. Which means that you'd be yanked as a parole violator if the police thought you were hooked up with the disappearance. You find the boss. I pay. I don't want your money. What kind of a rap were you jailed on? The one you've been paroled for? Oh... Fight in crap game. With a fellow who thought you threw too many sevens? Oh, no. no. Was uh, Revens that night. But was his own dice. Uh-huh. Ever have any trouble with your boss? Yes. We went to want to go home, back to islands, to Luzon when parole is over. Is why Mr. Templeton is mad. When I tell him his soon goodbye, he... Uh, he Blew uh, his top. Oh, you said it, you... Mr. Templeton say he call Boris and tell him I squeeze oil and gasoline bills for to steal money. Uh-huh. Huh? When did you see Templeton last? Uh, two nights ago. I drive him home and put car away. I go to apartment yesterday. Is no answer. No. no. I call on telephone today. Is no, no, no answer. I go to apartment again tonight. Is no answer. He's disappeared. He's maybe dead. We better get into that apartment and have a look. <laughs> You see, Detective Race, he's gone. We might get a line on where he's gone, though. You're familiar with his dress. Check the bedroom closets and see if he took any clothing with him. I'll look through this desk. Oh, he's good. I don't... The contents of Templeton's desk gave no clue to his whereabouts, but the search wasn't boring. There were a dozen bank books held together by a rubber band, all showing sizable balances. In another drawer, also bound by a rubber band, was a stack of pawn tickets, again for sizable sums. In the same drawer was a ledger and a list of money transactions with pawn shops in major cities all over the country. But it was in a little metal filing box that I hit the jackpot. A batch of precious stones in various settings. They looked like the Bavarian crown jewels. I spilled them out on the desk as Viventi came back into the room. Oh, uh, it's changed mine, Detective Race. Yeah, what about? You forget case. Mr. Temperton, just go away. Uh, vacation. You got the jitters, Viventi. What did you find in there? Oh, uh, nothing. I think I'll take a look. Uh, no, 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 you go Step away. Step aside. No. The bedroom was just as it had been at first glance, a portrait of Jonathan Templeton on the wall dominating the room. But now the closets were open, staring at me from one of them, but not seeing me was the face that had posed for the portrait. 
Jonathan Templeton had been strangled by a brightly colored necktie. I turned back to Viventi just in time to see an iron paperweight do things to my conscious mind. <laughs> When I came to dawn like my head was breaking, I made an anonymous call to the police, tipping them off about the body, and then I stuffed the jewelry and the pawn tickets into my pocket for future reference. I was about to leave the apartment when the phone rang. I answered it. Hello? This is Lombard. Get that ring back here and get it back fast unless you want trouble. Which ring and where shall I bring it? Don't stall. You know which. Who is this? A friend. Just a friend. Who is it? Hello? Hello? A man named Lombard, and he wanted a ring. It was something to remember. I stepped to the door out into the hall, just in time to bump into a female who might have stepped out of a drawing by Varga. Oh, oh excuse me. I, I didn't see you. It's all right. I'm not hurt. I was coming in to see you. So I notice, with a skeleton key in your hand. You give me little choice. I must have that ring... You promised. I, I have paid you all I can. How do I know the ring is yours? Why do you torture me? You know the crest. It belongs to Count Rufano. I must have the ring when he returns. I must. Lombard wants the ring, too. What am I bid? This is my final bid. A twenty-two pistol and monogrammed. What will they think of next? I warn you. I've got bad news for you, Ducky. I'm not Jonathan Templeton. Then where is he? Well, that depends on the kind of life he lived, because he's dead. And those sirens mean the police are coming to find out why. I'm getting lost and humbly suggest you do the same. Well, 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 the wandering boy comes home and where have you been? Out. Out, he says. I've been looking for you all night. You was a guy which was going to bed oily, and now you tell me you went off and had a ball Marcus, all by yourself. when I set out, I met out cold. Mm. Somebody caressed me with a paperweight. Although I can't understand why he ran off and left these behind. Holy cow, what rocks. Hey, look, you didn't go off your trolley and knock over a jewelry store now, did you? No. Mm. But somewhere in this stuff is the clue to a man's murder. Come on. That's good. Come on, where? Down to the police robbery detail to check on these things. They're probably stolen. We can locate the owners through insurance pictures and circulars. The police check turned out to be a blind alley. Not one of the pieces showed up on the list of missing jewelry. I took out the batch of pawn tickets I had lifted from Templeton's desk. Mark and I made the rounds of the three gold ball establishments. The answers were all the same. In each case, a man answering Templeton's description had pawned a valuable piece of jewelry. The handwriting on the pledges matched, too. But he used a different name each time. We continued our march down Spring Street. Well, uh, here's another pawn shop. Hmm. Miller's. What did he drop in here? That's funny. What? There aren't any tickets for Miller's. Yet he hasn't missed any of the other shops on Spring Street up to this point. And there are tickets for places further up the street. So? So, I've got a hunch. Give me your wristwatch, Mark. My wrist? What for? I'm going to pawn it. I left my watch back at the hotel. Well, how convenient for you, Come on, come on, come on, Marcus, give. All right, here. I'll put it on and go in there. Here, you take the tickets and check the rest of the pawn shops. I'll meet you back at the hotel. Yeah, yeah, everything happens to me. See you later. Well, what can I do for you? I'd like to get $10 on this wristwatch. I'll take it off. Here. Hmm. Nice watch. But it's not yours. What did you do? Take in a crystal ball on a pledge? No. No, you had it fastened through the second hole in the watch band, but there are signs of wear on the band near the fourth hole. The person who wears this watch has a smaller wrist. Hmm. Maybe we ought to trade places. In this business, uh, one must be an observer of human beings and a student of human nature. In your studies of human nature, have you ever come across a specimen named Jonathan Templeton? Uh, yes. Yes, I know Jonathan Templeton. By other names, he plagues many pawnbrokers. Plagues them? How? By borrowing large sums of money on worthless collateral. Well, maybe I have some samples of his merchandise. Take a look at these. Mm, where'd you get them? That's not important. Are they worth anything? Well? No. Settings are gold and platinum, but the stones, they're mostly white zircons. 
The zircon is only a semi-precious stone. Well, how about this ring? The royal crest of the Trofano family with the large diamond. Also a zircon. Worth perhaps $100. By many pawnbrokers might give a 1000 on it. Are you kidding? No, they are only businessmen, not jewelers. Most of them are not students of real values. Only one who knows jewelry well can tell a flawless white zircon from a diamond. The ring would certainly fool me. But that's why it could also fool a pawnbroker. And if the pledge is not redeemed... The pawnbroker is stuck with it when it's appraised for sale. That's right. The more ethical pawnbrokers take their loss and try to be more careful. But there are others who try to get even by passing the collateral off on another broker. And that's where a man like Templeton gets into the act. The broker who gets stuck hires him to stick some other broker. Yes, for a very large commission. Did Templeton ever work for you? He's never passed anything here according to the tickets. I know fine things. He could not fool me. Well, can you think of any broker in town he might have worked for? Perhaps there are others for whom you have no tickets, like Charles Lombard. Lombard? A pawnbroker named Lombard? On South Hill Street. Can I help you? Are you Lombard? Yes. I'm a private investigator. I'm trying to locate some merchandise stolen from a client of mine about a year ago. I don't take in stolen stuff. I didn't say you did. I just want to look through your back files. Something wrong? Your voice. I've heard it before. <laughs> I was on a radio quiz program a few days ago. Yeah, maybe that's it. What do you want to see? Your files from seven or eight months ago. Unclaimed stuff is sold if it isn't redeemed in six months. I know. I guess it's all right. The files are in the cage here. I'll show you. If the crest ring had come from Lombard's and had been passed to Templeton, I wanted to know who had dropped it off originally and why Lombard wanted it back. I rifled through the file, and there it was. It had been pledged by a woman, Maria Neiman, and her initials matched the MN monogram on the 22 that had been jabbed in my ribs outside of Templeton's apartment. I prepped a few questions to shoot at Lombard, but just then another man came in. Listen, Lombard, Templeton's dead. Take it easy, Kraft. Oh, any news? I knew something was wrong. Call again about the ring. I thought you'd be there by then. Maria went up herself. It was too late. Did you get a chance to look around? No. Somebody was coming out of the apartment. Must have been the same man who answered the phone when I called. Yeah, she said he was big, about six feet. He was wearing a blue suit. I was hidden from him by the grill of the cage, but he started to describe me like a police bulletin. It was time to let the sun set on the little island of precious pawn trinkets. I came out of the cage and headed for the door fast. So long and thanks. Find what you wanted. Hey! He's the guy. Grab him. Get me. Uh -oh. I managed to dump the Lombard and a man named Kraft made the door. But as I stepped into the street, the face of Maria Neiman stared into mine from a car parked at the curb. Then all of a sudden, she had three eyes, and one of them was the muzzle of that 22. I yelled, stop, thief, and started after a man who was running for a trolley. It served its purpose. A crowd fell in behind me, blocking her aim, and I beat the man I was chasing to the trolley by a good five yards. We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. And now, back to the adventures of Frank Race. It was one of those rough days. Getting hit on the head and shot at had turned the case of Jonathan Templeton from a matter of idle curiosity to a matter of personal interest. I wanted to have another little chat with Vivente, who had left me speechless in his boss's apartment. So, at 10 o'clock that night, I sashayed into the rendezvous ballroom, a dime-a-dance joint where many of Aventi's compatriots spend their evenings and their money, worshipping the biggest blonde Amazon since the gold rush. The orchestra was in a break, and only the pianist was left, beating out a dreamy improvisation. I spotted my quarry in a dim corner of the hall near a fire escape. Friend Vivendi was cradled in the arms of one of said Amazons who was gently rocking his dream boat. Hello, honey. Want to dance or talk? Or... No, thanks. On all counts. Uh, a big shot. Hello, Vivendi. Come on, Junior. Show your face. No, no, Prince. You go away. Not the Vivendi. No, no, no. Beat it, Bob. Don't bother my customer. Here's a fistful of tickets, baby. Your partner and I want to sit this one out on the fire escape. Well, thanks. 
No. Oh, you find the vent, you? It's a gift. Come on, Romeo. Out on the balcony. Know anything about a pawnbroker named Lombard on Farrell Street, Vivendi? Oh, he uh, sometimes go there to pick up little packages for Mr. Templeton. Ever hear Templeton mention a man named Contrafano? No, no. How about a man named Kraft? Oh, he's come to see Mr. Templeton sometimes. I drive him in car once with his girl, name of Maria. I read them out on Cononia Rombard pawn shop. When was that? About seven or eight months ago? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, spring. Is good? Maybe. It helps. Now, look, Vermetti. You better call your parole officer and turn yourself in until I clear this up. Oh, no, no, no. With man dead is bad. Uh, find who killed Templeton. Goodbye, please. His box toe shoe caught me in the shin and I jackknifed while he went down the ladder into the street. Try following a man down a ladder when you have only one working leg. If you can do it, you're a cinch to make the fire department. I tried to figure my next move, and it was hours before a germ of intelligence bored its way into my brain. I was trying to do the chasing when I had possession of the ring. I went back to my hotel, turned on all the lights, and waited for them to come to me. I didn't wait long. Come in. Don't reach for the artillery in your purse, Maria. I happen to have a gun this time myself. Oh, when I shot at you, I, I didn't know that you were a private investigator. No, you thought I was a clay pigeon. I can't help what you think. I will pay you well if you will return the ring you have, the one with the Trofano crest. How much? Well, I have $500. It isn't worth any more than 100 bucks. I know. I don't care about the actual value. I must have the ring by tomorrow morning. What's so important about it? The Count may be here tomorrow. We're to be married. <laughs> Give me that ring. Give it to me. She came at me with her nails flying, and I grabbed her. Then she tried to give it that 22 again. I don't like to argue with ladies when they're armed to the teeth, so I put her to sleepy by. Just as Mark came into the room. Well, what, 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 what? I will be a horse's neck. Brother, that caveman stuff went out with high button shoes. Race, you cannot go around slugging dames if and If you would be more observant, Mark, you'd note that the lady is toting a gun. Gold-plated, it's true, but deadly. Hey. <clears throat> That uh, thing could almost make dying a pleasure. <laughs> what a gimmick. Give her some water, then show her out. I'm going to call on another lady. But, but it's almost 3 a.m. Just about the time this particular lady will be having her nightcap in the small private room of Chico's nightclub out on the strip. Who is the babe? Her name is Sissy Waterfield. She writes the best society column in Los Angeles. I've got to find out a few things about a man named Count Trafano. <laughs> Sissy Waterfield wasn't hard to find at Chico's. There was the usual crowd of males surrounding her. I took a seat at a corner table and waited until she saw me. She pushed her way through the team and came over, the beauty of her blending with the soft beat of the piano. Hello, Grace. Why, the pot, honey. I read in the papers you were in town, but you didn't call me. Papers also told where I was staying. You didn't call me. <laughs> I thought of it. Good girl. But you're a difficult man sometimes. I learned that on my last trip to New York. You were getting serious, sissy. It didn't become you. Not with that playgirl facade. <laughs> I thought you were going to leave, sissy. Oh, Jerry, darling, I've just found an old friend. Why don't you run along? How will you get home? Race will take me. Won't you, Race? Well, yes. Call me tomorrow, Jerry. Good night. Oh, he didn't like that. <laughs> I'm a beast. I wouldn't have done it for anyone but you. You know, I believe you, don't you? I need some help, sissy. Anything you want. Just ask. <laughs> what do you know about Contrafano? Hmm. Well, I wrote a column about him just a couple of weeks ago. He's a dear. A scoundrel, but charming. We were engaged once. Well, I didn't know that. Didn't last long. He went back to Europe a year ago. Some sort of court trial. His family estates had been seized just before the war, and the poor darling was broke. A year ago? But you said you did a column on him just recently. Mm -hmm, I did. His case had dragged through the courts and it was just settled. He got his estate back, a castle on the Riviera, the works. So he's coming back to America. He said some ridiculous thing in an interview over there. Something about coming back to the woman he loves. Know who the woman is? With him, it's hard to tell. The competition was heavy. That help you? Yes, plenty. Good. Because I don't want to talk anymore. 
Take me home, darling. I took Sissy home. I helped her wind the cat and put the clock out. We made some confetti in case we should ever go to the Mardi Gras. Then I kissed her goodbye and headed for downtown Los Angeles. I got there just in time to see Lombard open his pawn shop for the day. I waited in the street for a minute or two, then I followed him. You! Don't go for that gun, Lombard! I managed to get one of his arms up behind his back, pinned him to the mat, and sat on him. Let me out. After we've had a little chat. I'm warning you, I'll call the police. You're in no position to call anybody, legally or physically. Now, what goes with that ring, or do I have to break your arm? <laughs> The girl pawned it. She didn't come back for it in the six-month period, so I tried to sell it. And then you found out it was a piece of junk, so you gave it to Templeton to unload. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, she came back with the ring. I called Templeton, but he wouldn't give it back. He wanted to keep it. Did she know that? I told her. Her boyfriend, Harry Kraft, knew Templeton, and he went to him, but he wouldn't give it up. He blackmailed the girl. For what? I don't know. Why were you so hot on getting the ring back? I wanted to give the ring back to the proper owner since she wanted it. Well, that sounds honest and ethical. Now, one more thing. Where does the girl live? Why? So you can blame me. The Regent Arms, near La Brea. That's better. Thanks. I'll be seeing you. My visit to the Regent Arms was brief. Nobody was home, so I whiled away the time by opening and closing drawers. There were several blackmail notes from Templeton to Maria Neiman, and a bunch of torrid love letters from Harry Kraft to Maria. Another item of interest was an unused marriage license, just two weeks old, made out to Maria Neiman and Harry Kraft. That was what I was looking for. I called Mark at the hotel and told him to meet me at Kraft's house. I got there first. Back your camp into the... Oh, it's you. Going someplace, Kraft? Is that the cab, Harry? Better come in. I think so, too. Oh, Mr. Reyes. I, I know it's a little late, but I, I want to apologize for all the trouble we've caused you. Skip it. You mean that? Sure. Your girlfriend offered me $500 for this ring I've decided to sell. Well, what's the matter? No takers? Well... You see, Maria wanted the ring back uh, for sentimental reasons, but... But now I don't. Harry and I have become very close in the past week or so. And you've decided that he is your own true love, right? Uh, I guess you could call it that. Old friends for a long time, and then all of a sudden in a week, love. I, I guess that's the way it is, Rice. Foolish though it may seem. Foolish? It's unbelievable. What do you mean? Well, your intuition must be strong because you took out this marriage license two weeks ago before you even fell in love. Where'd you get that? In Maria's apartment, along with a bunch of love letters you wrote, also before you fell in love. You thought the good Contrafano had passed out of your life, but then he turned up rich when the European courts verified his rights to his family estate. That's why you and Maria never used this marriage license. Guess again, wise guy, because we are going to use a license. We're getting married today. Why? Because of your great love? Or so you can't testify against each other? Testify? For what? For the murder of Jonathan Templeton. Templeton figured out how you planned to take the count and he wanted the cuts. But we had nothing to do with the murder of Templeton. Is that right, Harry? Turning state's evidence isn't a bad idea when the going gets rough. I'm sorry, Maria. He's right. Harry, what? You better tell him, baby. I have nothing to tell him. I... You tell it, Harry. I drove her there, waited downstairs. Maria went up. That's a lie! She wouldn't give her the ring, so she strangled him. Liar! Calm down, honey, calm lying. down. I know he's lying. Because you'd never seen Templeton, and you didn't know he was dead. You thought I was Templeton when you met me in the hall. What are you trying to do, frame me? I'm getting out of here. Not until you get a police Boy, report. Race. I'm holding. Oh, I've killed him. Speak to me, lover. Speak to me. Oh, he isn't dead, honey. That was a nice shot with that bottle. But what a waste oh, of good lover. bourbon. And so, I endure that little scene until Mark came in, followed shortly by the police who took over. Then Marcus and I flagged a stray cab and headed back to the hotel. <laughs> Ain't that a panic? Imagine that dame bawling up about a guy which tried to set her up for the gas chamber. Now, how does that fit? Women are funny, Mark. Dad, that <laughs> dumb thing. That Count Trafano character wasn't coming back to marry you. Ah, there's a story in today's paper about him. He married some uh, uh, 
Yeah, some fat blonde in Milwaukee. Her old man's a beer barrel, the story said. A beer baron, Mark. Well, ain't that what I said? I guess the Count was quite a Casanova. He must have had those phony rings made up by the gross to pass out like gumdrops to gullible females in exchange for their lovely, lovely kisses. Mm. Which is no crime if a guy can get away with it. Hey. What? I wonder how much it would cost to get me a batch of those things. And Marcus? I, I, you know, I... I uh, just wondering, that's all, just wondering. Can a guy even dream a little? Adventures of Frank Ray, starring Paul Dubov with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Georgia Ellis, Eve McVeigh, Parley Bayer, Gunnar Peterson, Bert Holland, and Jack Crucian. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production.